الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد Praise be to Allah the most gracious the most merciful and peace and blessing of Allah be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who came with the Quran and with its equal ومثله معه with something that explains the Holy Quran the Quran, as we know, is, is Kalamullah, the words of Allah. But the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent to explain to us these words of Allah. And that's why when Allah mentioned that He will save His words from being changed, as it happened in the religions before Islam, he mentioned Qur'an and Sunnah. He did not say, Inna nahnu nazzalna al-Qur'ana wa inna lahu But he said, Inna nahnu nazzalna al-dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidhun. So, dhikr, whether it's Qur'an or Sunnah, is, walhamdulillah, saved by Allah from changing and from uh, being uh, uh, changed in any way by changing the wording or changing the meaning even or changing the action. Today we will talk uh, uh, about uh, the prayer and this will take us inshallah uh, two lectures and today is the introduction and this introduction is uh, is a very important one because it's an introduction to all type of uh, ibadah in Islam and it's an, an introduction to the religion of Islam in actual fact and to the way by which the Muslims can unite on the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As we know the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have said that uh, the other nations divided, the Jews and the Christians. And he said that this nation will divide into many sects. In some hadith, more than 70, uh, more than 76, 73 sects of Muslims. And the one whom Allah will save is the one who follows what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do or used to say or used to act upon and what his Sahaba, the closest followers of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if you want to know whether anything you do which is part of your religion, Islam, is truthful and righteous or not, then you have to ask yourself, is what I'm doing according to what Allah said in the Holy Quran and according to how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu have acted and showed his companions and is it according to the way the companions followed the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu so if your action or doing or saying or dhikr or any type of worship is according to that, then this is the type of worship that Allah will inshallah accept. And this is the type of worship that Muhammad وسلم, the Prophet of Allah, will, uh, will be happy with when we meet in the hereafter on his river, Al-Kawthar. 
where a lot of people will come to drink in the day of judgment people will be resurrected and they will be waiting more than 50,000 years just for Allah to start their judgment and during that time uh, the sun as the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said will become very near to people nowadays it's so far away million of years of what they call uh, light years and light travels 300,000 kilometers per second and this is one year of light and millions of these years and still the sun calls sunburn isn't that true so and the hereafter the sun comes very near to the earth and only those whom Allah want to save will be saved on that day so in that bad condition nowadays when they are making a, a bus station or a bus waiting area people are not happy in the summertime they want the bus waiting area to be air conditioned isn't that true and if it's not air conditioned then there will be no more work up in Doha it has to be air conditioned isn't that true and if it's not air conditioned then people will say why is this it's very hot I'm sweating I cannot wait this is bad public transport so and, and this is with the Sun far far away from us so in this in the hereafter when people are in that condition and some of them their sweat is up to their neck and some of them their sweat is up to their mouth and some of them their sweat will drown them and each person his punishment or his savior on that day is according to his deeds and when people become so thirsty then there is only the river of the Prophet Muhammad Al-Kawthar which is which Allah mentioned in the Holy Quran that if you drink from that river on that day you will never feel thirsty anymore and it's that time when a lot of people will come to that river and there will be angels chasing them away and they will be surprised they will say we are Muslims why are we chased away and the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he will call upon the angels he will say my ummah my nation my followers and they will say you don't know what did they change after you so they followed ways other than the way of the Prophet Muhammad they followed sunnas other than the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad they divided into sects and groups each group each group is happy with what they have each group think that they are the righteous and the righteous group is the group that follow what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, say and what his companions how they followed and how they acted also because if you look at sects and groups each group claim that they are the followers of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. but when you come into testing when you come into action then you will see that the way they act is not according to the way the Sahaba عنهم, acted and that's the main difference a lot of people nowadays we have people who say that we only follow the Holy Quran because the Holy Quran is 100% truthful no changes and we don't follow the Hadith because the hadith there are there is da'if there is mawdu' there is sahih there is uh, uh, hasan there is hasan li ghayri there is so many hadith so many people said lies one man before he died 
He said, I made more than 1,000 hadiths out of his head. <laughs> he made more than 1,000 hadiths out of his head. Why? He wanted people to go back to the Holy Quran. So he invented hadiths that make people like to read Quran more. So if you read Surat Al-Kawthar, you will, you will be tomorrow and you are a single man, you will become married. So what you will do? You will read Surat Al-Kawthar. So he started inventing. He said, if you read this verse, you will get 70,000 angels listening to you. And the 70,000 angels will make, will, will, uh, another 70,000 angels will listen to them. And this will duplicate until they reach uh, the seventh uh, layer of the sky. And that's how many rewards you will get for reading that holy verse or holy ayah or, or surah. Mm -hmm. So he thought that he was doing well because he was inventing something to make people become more religious. But the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّأْ مَقْعَدُهُ مِنَ النَّارِ It said that if you lie and if you say that something is hadith and it's not hadith, then you have a chair booked for you in hellfire. So, so these people who say that we, are, we follow only the Holy Quran are totally wrong. And our lecture today will prove that because if you only follow the verses in the Holy Quran, show me the verse that tells you that Fajr prayer is two rak'ah. And show me the verse that tells you that Asr prayer is four rak'ah. And show me the verse that explains to you how to make ruku'ah. Or the verse that tells you how to make sujood. Sujood is mentioned in the Holy Quran. But what is sujood? Is it to put your head uh, down and your foot up? Or to put your nose only on the ground? Or to put your mouth on the ground? Some people do that. They kiss. The, that's why you have to always have a clean carpet because some people will put their mouth on the carpet. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so if you don't have a clean carpet, then they will get uh, uh, a problem. So in any way, what is sujood? We don't know. If you only rely on what is in the Holy Quran, then you will not learn your religion. Isn't that true? So we have to have the sunnah that explains the Holy Quran. We have to have the action of the Prophet that explains the Holy Quran. And that's why, and that's where people differed. That's where people had different understandings. Now some people had their understandings according to the evidence they used to have. So for example, if you come to me in the 1960s and, and say, I have deafness, which is my speciality, treat deaf people, then the only thing I can treat you with in the 1960s now is to get a horn and shape it to fit here and then you will hold the horn so that the voices will go in and will become concentrated. That's all they had in the 1950s or before that. Isn't that true? And then the hearing aid, the first hearing aid used to be a bag. You have to carry a bag with you and that's your hearing aid. So if we come now in year 2011 and when you come to my clinic, I give you this, the bag of the 1960s, I will look very bad. Isn't that true? So, so uh, uh, you, uh, some scholars at the time when they were living and where they were living, the only thing that they could depend on to give their verdict is what they have. So in Doha, if you come to a clinic and you, you need a hearing aid, you expect a very nice, small looking hearing aid 
very fancy looking with FM system, Bluetooth, huh? and maybe you can use it as a USB 2 giga. You can remove it and put it in your USB. Uh, and, and it recharges by USB recharge, car recharge. But there are countries, nowadays, 2011, there are countries that still live in the 1960s. Yes? So, in these countries, they don't have hearing aids. They never heard of hearing aids. Some countries, you will, you will say, no, it's not true. No, I've seen it. I went to a few countries, they know nothing. They don't have a hearing aid dispenser. They don't have a glass, eyeglass dispenser. So you can be blind in that country just because you don't have a glass that make you look, you know, that, that clarify your scene. So some scholars, we're living far away from the origin of Islam, which is Medina and Mecca. And years ago, when they want to hear a hadith, they don't write Google search the hadith. Isn't that true? They did not have emails. They did not have airplanes. They did not have even cars. They did not have even fast horses because most of the scholars used to be uh, poor people. Most of them. Very few scholars were rich. So, uh, at, uh, that scholar used to have certain solutions and used to have certain hadiths that he heard and learned certain knowledge. According to that knowledge, he gave his verdict. But when his knowledge expands, he might change his verdict. Imam Shafi'i traveled to Egypt. He was in Asham and he traveled to Egypt. And there he learned many more hadiths. And his verdict in so many uh, so many things changed. And now, his verdict about Islam is different than if he go to Medina and he learn from scholars there, he will change. Isn't that true? And his, all his verdicts will change because he will gain knowledge. So, for example, Imam Abu Hanifa used to have two main students two main very good students. And these two main very good students of Imam Abu Hanifa changed his own madhab on more than one third of his madhab. More than one third of what Imam Abu Hanifa, their, his, their own teacher, more than one third of what he taught them, they have changed the verdict after they moved from after they moved and learned in Mecca and Medina, they learned different hadith that they did not hear before. And that's how they changed their verdict. And this is, again, this is happening to us every day. Isn't that true? So today, if you learned that Hyundai is a bad car, you will not buy Hyundai. Tomorrow, the company will provide all the proofs that Hyundai is a good car. So you will change your verdict. And that's happening every day. You change your verdict according to knowledge. So, when there are differences between Muslims, the differences are accepted if their knowledge and if their area where they live is different. But when knowledge comes, and when it comes with a proof, not only any knowledge, because I can claim. But when you claim, you have to have, in, in Islam, you have to have a proof to your claim. So if you have a proof to your claim, then I, you should follow me, if I have a proof to my claim. But if you prove tomorrow that my claim is wrong, and you have a, a stronger proof than my proof, I should follow you. 
this does not mean that Muslims change their religion. No. What it means is they follow their Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When, when his words come, they follow blindly. This is the meaning of Islam. Islam, one meaning is peace, and another meaning in Arabic is to surrender. You, you are, you know, surrendering to whatever Allah say and his Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you see differences between Muslims in the way they pray, this is because they learned from different sources. But the source is one. Isn't that true? How many prophets in Islam? One or two? <laughs> one prophet. Now, some of, some of the uh, deeds in Salah and in Dhikr and so many things, the prophet have done the same deed in different ways. And only in that occasion, it is acceptable as sunnah to do that deed in different ways because the Prophet himself have done it in different ways. So what we are discussing now is general rules before we enter into the, uh, how the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam used to pray his prayers and how we should, as possible, follow him and why there are differences between Muslims in the way they pray because I assure you that the, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when he was alive he used to pray only one type of prayer so nowadays there is a Muslim who for example some Muslims when they are doing takbir some of them will do that way and some of them that way, not that way. You have to have your hand, okay? And some Muslims, you have to touch your ear. If you don't touch your ear, your takbir is wrong. <laughs> Isn't that true? <laughs> and if you forget to touch your ear, or suppose your ear was cut, then you have major problem. <laughs> you have to come to an ENT surgeon to fix another ear for you so that you can touch your ear before you make the kibir. So, some, they do that way. So what's the right way? Did the Prophet Muhammad, whatever you do in your religion, you have to think. Are you being guided or are you being guided by somebody else or are you being guided by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So how do you know? You, are, you have brains, alhamdulillah. You have cleverness. You have, alhamdulillah, books in all the libraries. And you have computers. You have CDs. You have Google. It's, it's not like before. You have to travel. Maybe two months or three months walking. Maybe you have a horse or a camel just to get one hadith. That's what the scholars used to do. They used to travel. Yani, some of the imams, they used to say, yani, I traveled and traveled and traveled until I started to have an estate. When he goes, azzukumullah, to toilet, blood comes out. Because he's not drinking, we explain it like that. He has kidney stones. Because he's not drinking, and he's walking in the sun all the time. So he developed kidney stones, seeking the knowledge of the Prophet Muhammad, the knowledge of the Qur'an and the explanation of the Holy Qur'an. But nowadays, it's so simple for you. You can just, you can, nowadays they have uh, Qtil, they have mobile internet. You can search everywhere. Huh? And now you have uh, these mobiles, you have Blackberry, you have all these things, and you can easily, so quickly, get any knowledge you need. So, nowadays, no Muslim should be guided blindly because nobody likes that, I assure you. Nobody likes that. Even your son, when he grows, when he reaches six years of age, he doesn't like you to guide him blindly and by force. You have to explain. You have to show him that this is the right, this is wrong. Do this because this is right. Don't do this because this is wrong. 
And if he force, then soon, sooner or later, he will have enough force to say, sorry, dad. I'm not going to do this anymore. He, now he is reaching the age of, if you don't have knowledge to convince him, he's not convinced anymore. He will be convinced by somebody else. So Islam is the religion of knowledge and it teaches us that we have to seek that knowledge. So again, I'm doing a long introduction because when we agree upon the points that I will talk about during the introduction, then we will agree upon so many things that we do. I myself, I, uh, my dad, my grandfather are followers of Imam Malik. So when I, used, when I was very young and I go with my dad to uh, pray in the mosque, he prays with his hand, not the right on the left. He, he put his hand beside his, uh, uh, you know, beside his body like that. And he says that this is the madhab of Imam Malik. And if I stand beside him and the other guy beside me, he puts his hand like that. As a child, sometimes I do what my father is doing. Sometimes I do what my neighbor is doing. So when I put my hand like that, my father will pull my hand down. Huh? Put it that way. I said, okay. <laughs> but then you reach an age where you start reading. And suddenly I was reading the Muatta of Imam Malik, the book of Imam Malik, the book of Hadith of Imam Malik. And one of the, one of the saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that I read in that book, is in the book of Salah that Imam Malik himself narrated that Ibn Umar uh, narrated that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, used to put his right hand on his left hand on, uh, during uh, the prayer. So I said to my father, Father, <laughs> please look, we are doing something wrong. He said, no, 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 this book is the wrong edition. <laughs> <laughs> Don't listen to these, <laughs> to these books. <laughs> so I said, uh, but uh, a lot of Muslims are doing that. So maybe they are right, we are wrong. I said, no, 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 we are right, they are wrong. <laughs> so, but you will reach an age where you will start to become, you know, you will have your choices, you will have your uh, ability to think, you will have, and that, uh, and that age, your dad or anybody who's teaching you, he knows that at that stage, the only thing that wins is knowledge. The only thing that wins is what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, and is it authentic, and how the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did, or how did they understand what he said? Because that's another thing. First, what Allah said. Second, how the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, explained it. Third, how the Sahaba acted upon the action of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. So Allah said in the Holy Quran, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقُ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ قَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So whoever take away other than the way of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ومن يشاء من بعد ما تبين له الهدى so if you follow a way other than the way of the prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم after the knowledge came to you so before the knowledge comes to you Allah said in the Quran ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا so if I do a mistake if I do something out of ignorance if I do something out of uh, forgetfulness O oh Allah, do not punish me. And Allah said, yes. He agreed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is in the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. So, but when you have knowledge, it's good and bad. It, it's good because uh, uh, the more you have knowledge, the more closer you are to Allah, the more you will be able to get good rewards because if you don't have knowledge, you will do so many things and maybe in the hereafter, they are worth nothing. 
we hear and we read every Jum'ah, if you read Surah Al-Kahf, Allah explains about some people that in the hereafter they come and they think that they have done so many good deeds but they discover their, that their good deeds were not good deeds. They will discover that what they have done is not uh, according to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or they, the way the Sahaba radiallahu anhum uh, have acted uh, upon that knowledge and in that way their deeds might not be accepted. So for example, you are a manager and you have a secretary and you told your secretary that anybody who make a phone call write his name and his phone number and the secretary without you asking he writes the name without the phone number are you going to be happy with him no is his work is going to be accepted no okay he writes the number without the name <laughs> It's even worse, huh? because you'll have to ring them all <laughs> and you don't know who they are. So, it has to be done the right way. If somebody, after Asr prayer, start and said, Allahu Akbar, and he started praying 2,000 rak'ahs. <laughs> From Asr to Maghrib, 2,000 rak'ahs. Each rak'ah, he, he reads only one verse. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Al-Fatiha, that's it. 2,000 rakahs. How much reward he gets? Zero. Not only zero. Now maybe somebody else have looked at this guy and said, MashaAllah, he's a very good worshiper. He's praying 2,000 rakah between Asr and Maghrib. So inshallah, from tomorrow, I will be better than him. I will pray 3,000. <laughs> huh? And then what will happen? That guy did not get any reward. And this guy followed him. And both will not get reward. And the first guy will get the punishment for leading the other guy ignorantly to the, right, to the wrong way. So, uh, so this is uh, just, uh, again, I will come to a few sayings of the Imams that a lot of the Muslims follow. And you will understand from their sayings that these Imams, they used not to ask people to follow their saying blindly. They used not to force people to follow their saying without even thinking. But before they say something, they have to have a proof. And if they don't have a proof, then they make a good effort to reach the righteous truth and they will act upon that good effort but when a knowledge comes to them and tells them that that effort is wrong then they will switch straight away to the knowledge that came to them so let me um, let me um, n let me narrate some of these sayings and maybe we will talk about few of them and inshallah if we uh, have the time we will start into the fiqh of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayer and inshallah tomorrow we will finish that but before I start narrating I have to ask whoever is managing the the meeting to tell me what time should we stop <laughs> because if you don't tell me I might not stop I don't have breaks <laughs> they forgot to fix breaks into me <laughs> so what time uh, 8 o'clock Eight o'clock? Eight tomorrow morning or tonight? tonight? <laughs> eight a.m. or eight p.m. You have, you see, you give me half the knowledge. You see, this is the problem when you don't get the full knowledge. So remember that there is first what Allah said: "Aqimu salah." that you have to establish your prayer. How? We don't know. We have to learn from the Prophet Muhammad So those who 
say, I will only follow the Holy Quran, they can, then they will not pray. Because how can they pray? Aqimu salah what do I do? How? But there is, a, there is an order there that you have to establish your prayer. But without the explanation of that order, you don't know how to establish the prayer. And that's why the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gets the reward of every Muslim from the first Muslim, who is who? Who's the first Muslim? Abu Bakr. Till the last one. Who's the last one? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. So, all these Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he will get exactly the same as their rewards, without any deficiencies. When you do an action, you might not get the full reward, but the Prophet gets the full reward. Because he taught you, but when you do the action, you might not do it rightly, and then you will not get the full reward, or you might do it with a bit of, you know, things inside your, for example, when you pray, as we will learn, some people get 100%, very, very few nowadays. I don't think, I don't know, I don't want to say 0% of people get 100% of the, their prayer. But let's say, inshallah, in every, in every time uh, Muslims are living, there are good scholars, very close to Allah, who prays and get at the end of it 100%, A+. Plus. But most Muslims get what? C, C-, minus, maybe B. B. Some Muslims get B. No B plus. <laughs> huh? So uh, what we want to learn is not only how to do the prayer and also we want to get, let's, let's be uh, realistic, B plus, full stop. A is very difficult, I assure you. A is very, very difficult to get the full reward of your prayer. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he mentioned this in the days of the Sahaba, not nowadays. In the days of the Sahaba, he said that some people pray, they get only half the reward. Some people even get less than half the reward. Some people get nearly nothing. And he saw a guy during his presence, he saw a young man praying and the, that man finished the prayer. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said to him, go back and pray. You did not pray. So he prayed again. And now he's supposed to pray a better prayer because he's showing the Prophet. And he prayed and failed. Zero. He said, go back and pray. You did not pray. So he prayed again. Third time. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said to him, you did not pray. Go back and pray. So that man said to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, This is what I know. This is his knowledge. This is what I know. Teach me. How, to, how can I do a, a prayer that is accepted? And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained to him the most important points to be done in the prayer. And upon these points, your prayer will be inshallah accepted and this is the actual title of our lecture is how the prophet muhammad sallallahu wasallam used to pray and why are we talking about prayer more than anything else because the prayer is the as the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said it's the most important pillar of islam huh? it's the first pillar and amud al islam true the, the, the prayer and in actual fact it's the one of the actions that if a Muslim do not do he converts from a Muslim to a, a non-Muslim according to most of the scholars a Muslim who does not do his prayer he is probably not a Muslim anymore because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said al salah that the difference between Muslims and non-Muslims is prayer. If you leave it, you, you will convert to 
you go to the group of non-Muslims. And if you establish it, you become a Muslim. So it's a very important uh, deed. Allah said in the Holy Quran, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَهُونَ Wail, Allah said in, uh, in the hereafter, there is a special area for punishment in the hellfire, and that area is called Wail. The name of that area is Wail. It's an area between two mountains in, uh, in hellfire. And that's where those who delay their prayer, they are praying, but they are sahun. Uh, they are busy, I cannot close my shop, hmm? business will be affected, I cannot put closed for prayer because business will be affected, I lose my job. Okay, I mean, there are solutions for these things. I, we can understand, but you have to do something about it. You have to seek another, maybe better job. And Allah said in the Holy Quran, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُغُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِدْ And if you uh, become close to Allah, if you have taqwa, if you, uh, if you do whatever Allah asks you to do and stop uh, from anything that Allah prohibits, then Allah will open doors for you. Will open doors for you. He, he is the one who controls your business. Your business can be good today. Tomorrow you've lost it. Oops. You've lost everything. Just like this water. I've lost now half of it. <laughs> I did not lose it all. I can still drink a bit. It's okay. It's okay. So... Um, so, um, uh, so again, uh, Allah controls everything. So, uh, prayer is first, and then everything else comes. Some of the uh, good scholars that recently only died, Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, uh, and he, again, we cannot be like these people. It's so difficult, but one has to try. But what I know from uh, his actions is once he hears Allahu Akbar, the first takbir in the Adam, that's it. Everything stops. No more work, nothing. That's it. He will go and make wudu and straight to the mosque. That's the way he was. Even if he is wherever he is, even if somebody outside waiting for him, V, 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 I, B. He will still do uh, uh, what uh, he wants to do, which is whenever he hears the Adhan, that's it. He stops. Even in his lectures. In his lectures, some of the, some of the scholars and some of the students of knowledge, we have seen uh, the Adhan of Isha, and then they will delay a bit the prayer, and, and then they will finish the lecture, and then they will pray, whatever. But Sheikh Nibaz was one of those who will not do that. Maybe he has done it once or twice, but usually, no. Once he hears Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, everything stops. He just repeats what the Muaddan says and go to ablution and to the prayer. That's it. But you are allowed, as a Muslim, you are allowed to, uh, you know, to talk or whatever in between, but at least don't miss the Faridah prayer in the mosque. Uh, especially if what is delaying you is something that in, is in your hand. So I'm not being delayed because I'm in the middle of the traffic and I cannot, I cannot park my car here. They will charge me whatever, how much they will charge. You know, I mean, there are good reasons that you can, in the hereafter, if you say that reason, you should think about it that way, that your reason is good enough to be said in front of Allah in the hereafter. If it's good enough, then it is good enough. If it's not good enough, then don't do it. <laughs> okay? So Allah said in the Holy Quran, فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ So those who pray, but delay their prayer, they will be punished severely. So what about those who do not pray? 
they will be punished more severely. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad saw, as it was explained, that uh, they are, and a lot of scholars, they will say they are not Muslims anymore. That's why some people will ask, I did not pray for one month and now I repent. So what do I do? Do I pray one month prayer? You know, I pay back prayers. And some scholars will say yes. Some scholars will say no. Because during that time, you were not a Muslim. <laughs> so at that time, you were actually not a Muslim. So prayers were not even obligatory on you because you left them. And you, became, you came out from Islam and now you are getting back into Islam. That's how bad it is. And that's how important is the prayer. And not only the prayer, what is important is establishing the prayer. Allah said, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَحَافِظُوا عَلَى الصَّلَاةِ Allah said, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ كَانَتْ عَلِمُ أُمِّنَّ كِتَابًا مَوْقُوتًا The prayer were ob obligatory on Muslims at specific and certain times. Sometimes, as surgeons, sometimes we end up delaying some prayers because we are in the middle of an operation. Sometimes this happens. Usually, we plan. And that's why I work only in the private, because when I work in the government, I cannot plan anymore. <laughs> if I say, okay, uh, uh, nurses and anesthesia and everybody, please, uh, we will pray Dhuhr and then we will start. They say, oh my, we want to finish now, please start now because we want to reach lunch at home. What about prayer, guys? No, sorry, if you don't want to do it now, do it tomorrow. We'll cancel the operation. Isn't that true? This is what's happening. So now I'm in the private and I can say to the anesthetist, okay, I want to do my, my uh, operation after Dhuhr prayer. Okay? And he will say, okay, because I will pay at the end of it. <laughs> Isn't that true? And, uh, I will pay for the, the hospital fee. So he has to do what I, whatever I want. Maybe that's why it's very good for a Muslim to do private business because you control yourself and you can do it the righteous way yourself and nobody can oblige you to do anything the way you think is not right and this is very important Ibn Mas'ud when he came to Medina the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, made him a brother with one of the Ansar and the Ansari he said to him, I have money, I will share it with you. And I have two wives. Choose the one that you want, and I will divorce her. And then after she finish her idda, you marry her. That's how, that's how close they were. And that's how Islam made them, you know, I mean, they want to give everything they have for their brothers. This is very difficult nowadays. Very, very difficult. So, Ibn Mas'ud said, Dulluni ala suq. He said, just show me where, maybe I'm mistaken, it's either Abd Rahman ibn Awf or Ibn Mas'ud. Abd Rahman ibn Awf. <laughs> so, he said, Dulluni ala suq. And he went, and Alhamdulillah, he became uh, one of the rich uh, companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi he said that, uh, uh, that those who give are better than those who take. Isn't that true? And I've done this because it's even when you give, your hand is above. And when you take, your hand is below. True? So don't be from those who take, unless it's a necessity. Be from those who give. And if you are from those who give, nobody can tell you, please brother, your, your beard is, looks very, it's, it's long. And if you want this, if you want to be with us in the business, you have to look more professional, more, uh, more uh, neat, you have to have, okay, make it circular, like the moon. 
Uh, they, they try everything. Okay, uh, color it. Color it. Make it uh, pink, for example. <laughs> uh, and, and, and this is how they... Uh, and if, if a Muslim has his own business and has, he controls his own rizq from Allah comes to him directly, then nobody can force him or control him. But if you are in the, which is most of the Muslims, are working for somebody else, then you have to be strong and you have to have taqwa in Allah. You know, you have to fear Allah more than that person. And Allah said, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, Man arda Allah bi sahat nas radi Allahu an wa arda so if you please Allah, even if people become angry with you, Allah will be pleased with you and he will make everybody pleased with you. And if you, and you will see that, I mean, it's amazing how some of the, those you know, very rich people, they have different people who work for them, but they trust the religious guy. Why? Because they know that he has principles. He has principles. He will not lie. Even if this man who will give him his salary, ask him to lie. He will not lie. He will not cheat. He will not say something that did not happen. He will not do anything wrong. He will not steal. And then he has the other guy who everything he asks him to do, he is it's done. <laughs> huh? When it comes to trust, he will trust the first guy. He will not trust the second guy. When it comes to uh, changing, replacing, he will replace who? The second guy. He will never lose the first guy. Unless he is the enemy of Allah, <laughs> then he will, <laughs> he will uh, try to get rid of the first guy. He will say he is mutasib, he is, uh, you know, backward, he is, we are, alhamdulillah, we are backward to the sunnah of the Prophet. We are mutasib to the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So, um, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he prayed once in his member, high up, so that all the Muslims will see how he prayed. So that they pray the way he prayed. So now, if he prayed, if he was one prophet, and he prayed so many years with the Muslims, so how come the Muslims are so different in their prayer? Some of them do so many things differently. Now, when you do something in the prayer, you have to ask, or at least read, or at least when you are asked, you have to have the proof that what you are doing is right. And if you don't have that for each action you do in the prayer, then you are just doing what you have learned maybe when you were in primary school. And you have never even, you had, did not even try to seek knowledge. And when you buy a laptop, what you will do first? You read the manual, isn't that true? And if anything goes wrong in that laptop, you will go to help and you will read and seek knowledge on how my laptop and why is this. And then when all the efforts are finished, then you take it to the laptop shop and say, please format, there is a virus. <laughs> format this window system and put another window system. Put me window 95, the best. <laughs> better than XB and Vista and all that, because they accept viruses. So, uh, so a lot of Muslims are in, in their worship, they are not seeking the knowledge. And all the type of worship, they are, a lot of Muslims, they don't seek the knowledge. They just learn it once, and that's it. Are they doing it the righteous way? Are they doing it the wrong way? Are they? And the problem, not only that, he will teach others how to do it, even though he doesn't know whether he's doing it the right way or the wrong way. And not only that, and if he sees somebody else doing it another way, he might argue with him, no, 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 this is wrong. 
you have to do it that way. And, and both of them, they, ha they don't have the proof of what they are doing. And at the end of it, this is the situation really that is happening in, in, in a lot of Muslim countries. People are actually doing in worship what they don't have a proof that the Prophet or his companions have ever done or have done it that way. But in actual fact, they follow a saying that is very famous in the Holy Quran. إِنَّا وَجَدْنَا آبَاءَنَا عَلَىٰ أُمَّةٍ وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ مُقْتَدُونَ وَإِنَّا أَثَارِهِمْ مُهْتَدُونَ That this is how I found myself. This is how my father used to pray. This is how my teacher used to pray. So, um, 810, <laughs> okay. 8 p.m. PM. Um, uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إن العبد ليصلي الصلاة ما يكتب له منها إلا عشرها تسعها ثمنها سبعها ستسها خمسها ربعها ثلثها نصفها So he said that a slave of Allah will pray a prayer he will only get one out of ten, one-tenth of the reward. He will only get one-ninth of the reward. He will only get one-seventh of the reward. He will only get one-sixth, one-fifth, one-fourth, which is 25%, and one-third, or 50%. And he stopped, the Prophet Muhammad. He did not say any more. <laughs> this is... The saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So, yes, we read. It's very nice to read how the Prophet used to pray. I mean, I think if we try even once, the Imam Ahmad and many of the Imams used to, when they hear any hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu they do it even once in their life. Even once in their life. So, when they read that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu stood up in the night time and he prayed with Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Nisa in one rak'ah and then he made rukur nearly equal to his qiyam. Then he made sujood equal to his qiyam and so on. So if you try that once, you will see how many of these two hours, you are concentrating on the prayer. You have khushu on the prayer. And you will see that probably less than one-tenth. <laughs> we will be in one-twentieth. Isn't that true? Because you will be thinking, what time tomorrow I will wake up, my this, and uh, did I forget anything outside? Is the socket on or off? Is the oven on or off? The gas, did I leave it on? All thoughts will come to your mind while you are in your prayer and all these thoughts eat away from your reward until you finish the prayer and you get hopefully 50% <coughs> so um, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa radiallahu anh, and we will finish with the narrations of these four Imams of how they used to follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When they hear a hadith of the Prophet, they used to stop at that hadith, even if their opinion is different. And this is real Muslims. A real Muslim, if you have your account in a, in a bank that uh, commit riba, once you have the knowledge that riba is haram in Islam, that one dirham of riba, and thankfully in Doha you have dirhams, huh? and rial, you have rial and dirham. One dirham of riba, but the Prophet here talk about dirham in his time, which is dirham of silver. One dirham of riba is worse than committing adultery 70 times. You see how bad it is? And if you take a, a survey, 100 Muslims, you will find 50 or more percent, they have their 
uh, accounts in Riba Bank. Why do you have your account there? Uh, my, my boss, he told me that. I have to open an account in, in this Riba Bank. Why do you have your account there? Because my job, they transfer the money to that account. Why can't you change that? You can say to the business guy or your accountant or whoever that uh, I want my account in an uh, Islamic bank. You see? So, uh, Abu Hanifa radiallahu an, he used to say that if I hear an authentic hadith and if the hadith is authentic, then this is my saying. So, if you hear an authentic hadith and you follow it, you are still following Imam Abu Hanifa because this is what he will do if he heard an authentic hadith. He said also that it's, I don't allow anyone to follow my saying unless he knows why I said it. This is very difficult. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you cannot follow. So he's saying, don't follow me blindly. Alhamdulillah, all the Imams, they never ask people to follow them blindly. Because otherwise, in the hereafter, anything you do wrong, you will say, Imam Abu Hanifa taught me. Imam Ahmad taught me. Imam Malik taught me. But they said that if I'm wrong, don't follow me. If you don't know why I said something or why my verdict was that verdict, then don't say that you are following me in that verdict. So he said to his companions, he said, I do not allow anyone who doesn't know my proof to say my verdict. So if you don't know what is my proof, don't say my verdict. Or don't say that this is my verdict, unless you say why I said it. So you have to have the knowledge. He said also to his students, he said, we are humans. We say something today, we might say something else tomorrow. We have a knowledge today, we might have a different knowledge. So following what the Sahaba or how the Sahaba learned from the Prophet. Then Allah will lead him, will lead him astray to wherever he wants to go. If you don't want to follow what the Prophet and his companions used to follow, then go anyway. Allah only guide you and then you have the choice to follow the guidance or not to follow the guidance and then in the hereafter you get the reward or you get the punishment. Very simple. So Allah did not oblige you to be astray nor he obliged you to become a good Muslim. You can oblige yourself or you can lead yourself astray. And that's why in the hereafter nobody can blame Allah. Allah is very merciful, but also He punishes. Allah is uh, forgiving, uh, forgiving, but also uh, He has a punishment. So we have to uh, follow uh, what He says, and inshallah He will save us from His punishment to His forg forgiveness and His reward, inshallah. So I will stop here, Zakhmullah khair, and inshallah tomorrow. Okay, a few minutes for questions and answers, and inshallah tomorrow. But anyone who, is, uh, who has enough or his battery is low, he can go and recharge. And tomorrow you can come back. If you have these solars recharged, now it's night time, so you cannot use them. <laughs> but if you have enough charge to listen to some questions and answers, you are welcome. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the facts uh, says that in Quran, there's only a mention of three prayers. Uh huh. They only mention three prayers? No, one of the uh. facts are like one. Yeah, yeah, as I said to you, those who. Uh, the question is one of the sects, Muslim sects, they claim that in the Holy Quran, Allah only mentioned three prayers. But this is not right. Allah mentioned yes. the five prayers in the Holy Quran. 
but their understanding is better than the Prophet, I think. And that's why they understood that it's only three prayers. You understand? This is exactly what they are saying. What they are saying is the Prophet and his companions did not understand the Holy Quran. They were sorry, they could not understand it the way they understood it today because they are most knowledgeable. They are better than the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu This is any, any innovator, any innovator, anyone who innovates anything in Islam, the first thing he's claiming is I am, I got a better understanding and something that the Prophet himself did not understand. And that's why I'm innovating this in Islam. You understand? Yes. So if somebody comes with something new, it goes without saying that he is claiming that he has knowledge that the Prophet himself and his companions did not have. Thanks to the internet, maybe the knowledge appeared with the Google or whatever, and before they did not have that. So, but they used to have something better than Google. Huh? They used to have Jibreel alayhi salam. Whenever the Prophet, the Prophet himself, sometimes, you see, this is also Muslims are in, in, in two polarities. One polar, they don't follow the Prophet and they innovate. At the other pole, they follow and they make the Prophet just like God. And then you have to be in the middle. Those, they don't, they reject the Sunnah. They say only we follow Quran. There are only three prayers. Uh, we pray anytime. You can pray anyway. You don't have to stand and do this because it's not mentioned in the Holy Quran. The prayer can be done even while you're walking, meditation, anything is a prayer. Hmm? And to them, maybe prayer is uh, supplication, not uh, action. And the other side, they make the Prophet like God. They worship him, they feel that he knows everything, that he has all the knowledge, that he has... And, and they forget about God who created the Prophet Muhammad So. Um, uh, so we have to be like the Sahaba the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was asked many times questions he could not answer until Jibreel Alayhi Salaam came to him and gave him the answer so many times uh, he was asked uh, for example by uh, uh, by the Kuffar Quraysh uh, about you know, by the Jews uh, uh, few questions that he could not answer and only when uh, the revelation come to him he could answer them and this shows that uh, again uh, that the Prophet وسلم, he does not know uh, what we call ghayb only Allah knows what is uh, uh, yani knows the whole knowledge so the Prophet وسلم, he knows things that Allah gave him the knowledge to know. Uh, so, um, like, for example, uh, uh, the holy uh, in the verses where uh, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was told by Allah what his his wives were saying. Uh, Allah said in the Holy Quran in Surah Al Tahrim, uh, yeah, that. Uh, how did this knowledge come to you, O Prophet of Allah? He said, Nabbani. Allah. Allah told me. So, uh, if the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if she knows that the Prophet knows everything, like some Muslims believe, then she should not have asked him that question. Isn't that true? She should not have said, who told you? Because he knows everything. So, he, he should not be told. You understand? So, uh, the, our answer to these people is وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّي مَا تَوَلَّى So those who innovate or who uh, start to say something that the Prophet and his companions did not do then they, are, they will be led astray. We follow what the Prophet and his companions uh, used to do. They used to pray five prayers, we pray five. They prayed 1,000 prayers, we have to pray 1,000. But alhamdulillah, we pray five and they are equal to 1,000. <laughs> so, uh, just my brothers and sisters, tomorrow we'll share with you the Timah Khutbah. 
and uh, inshallah with his permission we'll also have a chance to push and answers after that also and to remind the sisters that we still have some time so please have the subject to keep them on the During the, again, we, I gave you today a contract and you have to sign. And when you sign, then you will know the answer. And it's very easy, you see. Anything, any question like that, you have to ask another question. Did it used to happen? Did this happen during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and his companions? Yes or no? If it's no, then no. If it's yes, then yes. But uh, if you follow this simple rule, it's very simple. But if you will start thinking about it, then there are different sayings of different scholars. Some scholars allow, some scholars do not allow. But during the days of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, nobody used to pray a second prayer except once the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam have asked uh, one guy who came late to the prayer, he asked one of the people who prayed to lead him as an imam. This is after he found that this guy had a good reason for coming late and he came and the prayer finished. So he asked, I think it was Abu Bakr Siddiq عن, to lead him in the prayer. So. What the Prophet ﷺ allowed is for someone who prayed already to lead someone who did not pray. But what's happening nowadays is someone who did not pray is leading somebody else who did not pray. You understand? So what is allowed is what used to happen during the days of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ is a lot of the Sahaba, all of them, most of them pray with the Prophet in his mosque. And then some of them, they go to, their, to, the, to the area where they live. Maybe it's a bit far from the mosque of the Prophet. And then they lead the prayer with their jama'ah in that area. But in his uh, mosque, it happened only once that uh, a man came late and the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam asked one of those who finished the prayer, to pray, to lead him, to become the Imam, and the one who came late, he became the Ma'moon. Now, if this happened only once, then this was not the habit, isn't that true? So, which means again, that if this happens once upon a time, it's okay. But if it's happening every day, it's not okay. So this is if you want to follow our contract. If you have uh, another contract somewhere else, then you understand? Now, uh, if you come to the saying of the scholars, the scholars differ. Imam Shafi'i used to prohibit that, for example. It was not allowed. And uh, in actual fact, some in, uh, during that time, some innovators, they don't like to pray behind somebody whom they dislike, for example. So what happens is they all agree together, they, will be, they all come late and they pray separately. To the, to, the, to the point that one day Muslims used to pray in the same mosque four jama'ats four Shafi'i on their own Hanafis on their own Malikis on their own uh, Hanbalis on their own and any more sects they can pray also on their own and the, what we know is the Prophet and all his companions used to pray together not each one with his companions and otherwise Al-Muhajireen should pray on their own, Al-Ansar should pray on their own. Isn't that true? And then those who came from Faris and they became Muslims should pray on their own and those who came from Asham should pray on their own and, and then Muslims will divide. Uh, the other thing is that their prayer, especially when it's, uh, uh, when it's Isha or Maghrib, will uh, the imam who is reading there will distract all the people who pray sunnah because 
now they cannot concentrate on what they are uh, saying in their prayer because another imam is praying so there are many things that uh, make this uh, it's uh, the other thing the, the probably one of the most important points is having many jamaats will make people very lazy because when you are in your house and you hear adhan you will say okay and i will reach this second raka and then you will say Oh, I'm late. I will reach the second jama'ah. I'm very late. I will reach the fourth jama'ah. No problem. There will be always jama'ah. And if there is no jama'ah, I will get someone to pray with me. And we will become a jama'ah. Uh, but I assure you, only the first jama'ah get the reward. Get the full reward of jama'ah. The other jama'ahs, definitely they get less reward. Definitely. Because they are praying later than the first and again this will open the door for muslims to divide nowadays alhamdulillah this is it's happening just because muslims are lazy and they come late that's all that's the cause but um, in in the past and in some countries actually nowadays it's a fact in some countries each group and sect they pray they have a different time <laughs> their prayer is at different time you understand and that what makes Muslims divide even in their mosque let alone outside you know politics and whatever and all these things Muslims should be one unity one nation and they are now hundreds of nations different nations and in the same nation different sects in the same sect different groups and the same groups different thoughts and that's why we are weak so the best thing is uh, come for the first jama'ah. Uh, the sunnah, Ibn Mas'ud an, when he came to the mosque late, he did not pray in the mosque. He went back with those who came late and prayed together in their house. And maybe this should be yani, what, uh, what should happen to those who come late uh, so that um, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you come late to the, to the prayer and you do jama'ah and you think that you got the reward of jama'ah, the first jama'ah, then you will always come late. And anyone who teaches, who is a teacher, or he knows that if the student come to the school late and nobody punish him, what will happen? Tomorrow he will come late and nobody punish him. And then he will come late and then he, it's going to be his habit. So no. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wanted all the Muslims to be in the first line. But because not all of them can become to, to the first line, uh, then there will be second line, third line, fourth line. And only those in the first line, Allah and his angels will, uh, the angels of Allah will remember them in the vicinity of Allah. And only those in the first line that the angels of Allah will ask Allah to forgive personally, person by person. So make sure that you are here, not second jama'ah.